<laughs> we would we'd like to, to uh, welcome everybody out to the last of our Coastal Scholars programs for this academic year. We'll start up again uh, in the fall. Appreciate the fact you're able to make it today. Uh, we'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer B. Lilly Hand and Deanna B. Lilly. Um, I, I unfortunately cannot stay for the presentation. I'm sort of in the middle of a class. They've got a video going right now, so I'm going to have to head back. Uh, but uh, uh, we're expecting a wonderful program on synergis synergistic rhythms, poetry, and music. Thank you. Yeah, so hi, it's good to see some familiar faces in here. Um, so like you said, I'm Dr. Jessica Malillihand, and this is actually my wife, Gina Malilli. So we thought, you know, poetry and music go really well together. And I was really lucky being married to a musician. I could say, hey, I wrote this poem. Could you maybe write some music to go with it? That's easy, right? Well, sure. It's so, so that's what we did. Um, and so the way we're going to structure this today, we have a set of six poems. So these are poems that I've written. And I write for the page first. So I'm really interested in what's happening on the page. And then I like to bring it to the stage. So there's a lot of things going on that you might not catch upon hearing it, but with the music augmenting it, there are other aspects that come out through the performance. And then we'll actually go back through after we do the full set and talk about each one a little bit more, what's going on as far as on the page, as well as what are some of the choices that Gina made as she was composing the music to go with each one. Um, so I'm just gonna give, as we go through them, I'll give a little bit of information to set it up because when you're hearing it, you don't have the luxury of looking up a word or finding out about something you might not know. Um, but then again, we'll save the more in-depth analysis part for after. Ready? Yep. All right, we're high tech here too. So this first poem, Codependent Love Song, was published in Painted Bright Quarterly. Um, you probably know, but just to remind you, synapses are the spaces between nerves where those messages go across. Um, the hippocampus is one of the brain structures involved in memory, among many other functions. Flashbulb memories, I'll mention that, and that's a reference to uh, something that can happen with PTSD, where the memories can just come in a flash, unwanted and over and over. And then there are some other poets that I reference in here, Billy Collins, Yates, and Neruda. And the final thing about this one I was thinking about in my world lit class, we look at ancient um, Egyptian literature and the New World, the New Kingdom era. There's a lot of love poetry there, and it's very sensual. Um, and there's one, I wish I were her Nubian maid. And often it falls along ginger lines. The guys read it, and they're like, oh, it's so sweet. He's so in love with her. And the girls are like, this is really creepy. So here it's exploring where love can get a little creepy, even obsessive, but having a little bit of fun with it. Codependent love song. Baby, I'm a bag of synapses, clapping connections for you. Gonna pull out my veins, tie you to the bed. Take a kidney, take my breath, match my blood and take that to you. I will inhale your exhale, will break my bones to break your falls, will love my in-laws. Peel off my fingernails, tell me not to scream. Permeate my semi-permeable membranes and nourish me. Darling, I'm a rush of glucocorticoids. Hit to your hippocampus. All your flash, all your flash bulb, all your flash bulb memories will be of me. I will love you when you drip water on my soft feet. When you step with your shoes on my soft feet. When you roll the car over my soft feet. When you fleck my mirror with toothpaste. If I am the bread and the knife, you are the slicing, the opening me. If you are a rose in the deeps of my heart, my heart empties nutrients into your roots. Neruda would want your hands on his eyes the moment he dies, but Neruda is already dead. I am not dead, but if your life needs my life, so you can continue to walk on the sand, see suck me into your body until my body dies. Love, I'll live in your cells. The next poem, Pain.
Hurricane Jane was published in Reunion, the Dallas Review. Um, and you may need to know some of the background of this story. You would get it if you're reading it a few times over. It's about an electrocution. This character, Jane, shows up in many of my poems. There's some autobiographical elements, but it also goes far beyond that. Um, so this is about what happens with an electrocution and a nerve damage that happens as a result. And it feels literally like fire, so a lot of the fire imagery is playing with that, as if her body literally became fire, and then how people are reacting. Um, I think that's all you need to know with that. Pain, Jane. Once, Jane's body was not coals and flames. Once, Jane touched something she should not. A fire wire. That's when her synapses surged and crackled. That's when she plugged in her spinal cord. When brush fires first popped from her footsteps. Stop it, Jane said. Her parents said. The preacher said, stop it. The doctor said, it won't. It won't, the doctor said. The doctor roasted a marshmallow. A joke, the doctor said. You will want to die. But don't, said her friends. Lie back. We'll have a barbecue. Jane's brain began to think the way fire thinks. Jane wanted to lick everyone. The state of California banned her, even when she got a water wife. She was an act of God. Men flipped down masks, calculated her heat input, welded things together. Jane tried to keep her sparks to herself, but her friend's arm hairs kept singeing into burnt hair smell. Health insurance had talked to fire insurance, Fire insurance had talked to health insurance. All the ears closed. Fireproof doors. Stay home, the doctor said. But Jane would not stay home. Now that she was an eternal flame, she had to go to the graves, had to be the light lighting the path between the breathing medical procedure, and that's what this one's about. It's called a stellate ganglion block. If you're squeamish, you might want to close your ears for this part. Um, but in this procedure, you actually are put just partially to sleep, so you're not all the way under. You have to be awake for it so you can take directions from the doctor while it's happening. Um, and they take a needle and they put it through your throat all the way into your spine, and then drip lidocaine into your spinal fluid. Um, so that comes up in this, but there's also, you'll notice a very positive tone because it does help stop that really severe chronic pain, at least for a little while. <laughs> Including where it says, after music didn't hurt Jane, when we get to that, even sound vibrations can be interpreted in this pain condition as painful stimuli. Stellate ganglion injection bless Jane. Jane's vein opened up just enough to let the sleep drift in. Then deep in her neck, the needle somehow graceful guided the holy blend. Doctors and nurses brought their God faces closer. After music didn't hurt Jane, after her body got along with the world again, come find the amen under her tongue, the amen arching her back. Her bruised throat knows something of heaven. Let Jane try, love, to tell you. Jane is forthcoming in Typo magazine, and I was really thinking about how people are very obsessed with the shape of women's bodies, and people say, well, she's an hourglass, she's an apple, or you pear-shaped. 
Um, and then that idea you are what you eat. Similarly with this character Jane, after this kind of the stellate ganglion block, the next level is having a pump implanted that goes into your spinal fluid and there's a medication that's from a sea snail and it's the venom of the sea snail. And so I was thinking about the shape of that molecule and Jane becoming that shape. So what shape is she when she's that molecule? And actually giving her some power that you'll see. The shape of Jane. Jane is not an apple nor an hour and a glass. When fully folded, Jane is an inhibitor cysteine knot. Girls got three disulfide bridges on that hot structural motif. She is her own ring structure. Girls got chemical, thermal, and mechanical stability. Look closely. Girls, the shape of venom. She can paralyze you or heal you. Her peptide backbone is pierced. Look out. Jane carries an amino acid side chain. Crow back out on equal angles 
light waves. No, crow thought those other crows had to go, so crow cracked windscreens. But every eye of every crow kept moving. Poor crow crying, all 27 crow cries. No magic. Every driver heard crow land on every roof of every car, and crow bent down to peck those upside down crows while drivers looked for their dead. Crow didn't care what Athena said. Crow ripped rubber from wafer blades. Crow left his third leg in the sun so crow made evening last all afternoon. Crow found his nest removed. When crow whirled the three tenses together, when crow edged the circle of cars cawing, when crow made man and woman one in Egypt, when crow stole sun burnt feathers made moon, and when crow flew from the southwest at sunset, the other crows did all of these with crow. But when crow flapped wings without flight, the other crows and their cars crashed together. The other crows broke apart like stars. Now crow can live alone in the oak, happy for a crow. Thirteen. Black bird wore sheep's white cotton clothing, so the Janes thought he was a wolf. The boy who cried, cried. The last poem is to the cross-dressing cuttlefish. So this is not a Jane poem, so moving away from Jane. Anyone know what a cross-dressing cuttlefish is? Anyone know what a cuttlefish is? Yeah. Yeah? Like yeah, it's kind of like a squid. It's an invertebrate. Um, and it's the most intelligent of all invertebrates. And the cross-dressers, so cuttlefish, all cuttlefish are able to change the color of their skin. They have these nerve receptors just everywhere. And they mostly do it to camouflage. They'll hide from a predator or to catch prey. But they can also basically turn themselves into a disco party, and they're like flashing and making all kinds of crazy colors, and the prey is just like, what? And they're so confused that they're stunned, and then the cuttlefish can catch them. The cross-dressers are the smaller males, the mating strategies. They're not able to fight. They're not able to get past that big male. Um, so they'll actually color their skin to look more like the female's tended look. And they have an extra set of arms. So these are things you need to know to understand. Um, they'll hide that set. So then the biggest male thinks, oh, I just got another girl. And so they'll kind of slide around him to where the other girl is. And then quickly hand off. They have to keep their sperm in packets. And they just kind of hand it off. Um, so they'll quickly do that so that that's how they get around. And then the females, she'll take some packets from several different males maybe a small percentage of all those who try, and then later she chooses which one to use to fertilize the eggs. And really statistically significantly, like by a wide margin, she tends to choose the cross-dresser sperm. Um, so they, scientists have many hypotheses, I think maybe because there's that intelligence that the cross-dressers are showing, but that might be part of why that survival strategy that she chooses theirs. I think that's, oh, and you need to know that pupils are shaped like Ws something about the way that, that helps them have really great eyesight. And that comes up in here. And this was published in Poem Memoir Story. To the cross-dressing cuttlefish, when you are hungry, your skin dazzles your prey. Pincers lay limp for your chromatophore display. That gigantic brain sexes up your neurons so you can flash, can color wheel your way past any defense. Teach my skin to stun, to disarm. Voyeuristic divers wait for coastal waters to heat up. Witness you raise two tentacles like an evangelical ready to be ravished by God. Such a small male, your path to the female barred. You're not having it. With your sperm packet sealed, it's time to deliver. You hide your male arms, color your skin. If you were human, we would kick you out of school. We would pray for you, fist and belt against skin, color pattern of inherited fear. Oh, most intelligent of most intelligent of invertebrates, 
teach us to anoint our desires in the presence of enemies. The way you coyly swim past other males, making eyes at you. The W's of their pupils beginning to spell the word want. The way you let the biggest male think he has scored twice as you slide behind him. Like a preacher high on the body of Christ, ready to commune, you slide your packet into the pouch behind the female's mouth, where other males have already left packets, each hoping to be the chosen one. Once she sorts through the few sperm packets she allowed, she will usually choose yours to merge with the eggs into newly hatched hunger. Teach us to see what she sees. So thank you, that is the set. Then we can go back through and kind of talk about each one of them. And we have some slides, we have information for many of the poems, but we want to make it instead of just doing that and then saving the end for questions, if you have any questions, you can pop in with those at any time. So we'll actually start right now. If anybody has any questions that came up, we can hit those first, and then we can also flip back to the slides and get some of the prepared stuff. Any questions yet? Everybody just leave anything. <laughs> All right, so I've been mostly talking. You've just heard her blowing through these various instruments. So maybe we should start with letting them know what you've been playing so far. Yeah, I'll do that for the poem, probably. For, so the first poem we did, Codependent Love Song, um, I felt like I should be the really annoying character that the speaker's talking about. <laughs> um, so I picked the piccolo, which can't be an annoying instrument. I think it's beautiful. But it's very loud and very small, and um, I had to be careful with the uh, uh, what notes I chose so that I wouldn't totally cover her, but things like uh, tell me not to scream, she just stops and covers her ears so I can play a really loud high note there. Um, but it's uh, a really, it's really fun, really fun one to do, probably one of our most fun. Um, when she talks about Neruda dying, this happens a lot in several of the poems. I bring in the DSERA chant because every composer does that all the time. What is um, DSERA? And the DSERA is the uh, shows up in Barrow Symphony Fantastique. It shows up in every kind of requiem mass, uh, in the Verdi requiem, in places like that. So uh, it's kind of meant to be funny here, um, since that part is a little bit tongue in cheek. Neruda is already dead. This one was also a little bit more performance based. Uh, we did it for a specific event that we were going to be really silly with. So we had clapping together, and there's a lot of looking at each other in this that we had um, in the previous performance. But some of that was too silly for <laughs> for a <laughs> lot like important series. lecture. Yes. <laughs> so we, did, we took some of that out. Um, but yet, like I said before, so it was originally written for the page. Um, so we can even go back and look at on the page itself. So when you're analyzing poetry, whoops, you can see some of the stuff happening. Um, so like here, if you look at the second stanza, where it says, tell me not to scream, permeate, and then that line break, my semi-permeable membranes, the line break itself is mirroring that idea so a cell that has semi-permeable membranes can only be partially permeated by certain things. Um, so by having that line break, it's sort of trying to mimic that permeate, and then it's just this blankness. My semi-permeable membranes, so you can only sort of get in, so having that little bit of a pause is meant to mimic that content. Um, and then, where? I am the bread and the knife. So Billy Collins, I don't tend to bring him into my work. He's not. I'll probably get in trouble for saying that's not my favorite poet. Um, but Litany was his first poem I ever read. It was called Litany, and I really loved that poem, and I still really like that poem. And so his poem says, you know, you are the bread and the knife. So he's trying to say, you know, we have these, 
metaphors for love, and instead of just saying you're the bread, well, you're also the knife. So we try to bring in that complexity. You're somehow paradoxically both this wonderful nourishing thing and something that might be a little bit dangerous, um, and the interaction between the two. So I was bringing that in and then trying to build on that a bit. And then the Yates reference, if you are a rose in the deeps of my heart, so I just totally yanked that. That's why it says deeps, not depths, because that's what he used, and that was for the sound. Um, so that comes from Yeats. I'm trying to span, you know, various poets, various different eras. And, you know, Yeats is Irish slash English poet, um, but particularly Ireland. He brought back, you know, Irish literature. And then Neruda, I mentioned him specifically, but also the line about, so you can continue to walk on the sand, that da 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 That's from one of his sonnets. And there it's a very um, even iambic rhythm to mimic that walking. So he has a, many, many beautiful love sonnets, so I pulled from that as well. So that my poem would hopefully come to conversation a bit with some of these. So you may be wondering why we even did this in the first place. Um, and Jess actually asked me to write these, uh, to write music to her poetry, and I resisted at first, but then she created um, this character, Jane, that whose body falls apart and horrible things happen to her. And but then just, she can pull her body back together again. So. And it had such interesting rhythm. Um, I have the benefit of hearing Jess create poems, and there's a lot of rhythmic movement when she's doing it. She has to do it out loud because she's using a voice dictation uh, program. So I get to hear all of that, and it's really cool. Um, so it started to make sense that I could create these rhythmic things and these little flute gestures to enhance um, the poems. And what I looked to was, first of all, of course, the ancient Greeks, um, their poetry was accompanied either by a kithara, which is kind of a harp-like thing, a string instrument, or an aulos, which was, um, a, it looked like two recorders played at once, and one is kind of the drone, and the other one you could play notes on against that drone. We don't have much um, music from ancient Greece. There is uh, some papyrus with like one note on it, but we don't really know their notation, and it's very annoying. <laughs> but we do know for sure about their modes, so what um, notes they would use to bring out certain passions, and um, what uh, their, their poem, the, the meter of their poetry. So we at least know their rhythm and their language, but we don't know how they put it together. Um, but we do know that the Odyssey, all of those wonderful ancient Greek things had music to them. All the Euripides plays, I would love to go back in time to hear it. And then, well, I'm going to interject here. Yes. So with you know the poetry being accompanied by music and so wanting to bring that back, and it still happens a lot. I mean, we've got slam poetry now, so even if that's not with music, and sometimes it is, um, just bringing it back to be in an oral tradition. Again, I said I really like writing on the page, so I like what it happens through writing, through literature, some of the opportunities there that don't come out orally, but I really enjoy going back to those oral roots. And with ancient Greek poetry, she mentioned you know, the Iliad, the Odyssey being accompanied, in, and I wonder if this is how we lost some of the music. Linear B is a Greek writing system that we just know about, but it was lost. It was lost, there's war, there's fire, short, you know, long story short. We just know that it existed at one time, and that's when they went into what we call the Dark Ages. They are Dark Ages because they no longer had a writing system until later, and they borrowed from the Phoenicians and created one again. But in, that, in the meantime, they weren't just culturally dead. There was a lot going on. It just wasn't able to be written down. So the Iliad and the Odyssey were passed on orally during that time. Um, and so music and the rhythm helps also with just memory so that they would make changes along the way, but it helps people remember the main skeleton of those poems. So we have um, the idea of word painting in music. And there's this age old argument of are the words more important or is the music more important? And that depends on the composer and the era and all kinds of things. Um, so in church music, in Wagner operas, in lots of things, we have these little gestures to bring out certain words, crying motifs, John Dowland's lute music and songs, 
are the best place to find this very simple ba ya ba ya ba, this weeping sort of sound. Um, things that go up, the music goes up, things that go down into hell or any of those places, which happens a lot in Jesse's poems, <laughs> uh, I can go, you know, have these <coughs> gestures that move down. So I have a lot of precedent for just taking these ideas and then putting them into a, diff a kind of different musical language that fits the point. And then the biggest influence here is Arnold Schoenberg's Piero Lunaire, which premiered in 1912, um, and it busted open chamber, the world of chamber music forever. And in fact, our contemporary ensembles that exist today, like Ace Blackbird, the Pittsburgh New Music Ensemble, those um, organizations are based off of the instrumentation of Piero Lunaire, which instead of a string quartet or any of that, it was a piano, a violin, a flute, clarinet, cello, and a singer. And the singer is doing this very interesting thing called Sprechstimme, which um, I should have put an audio in that. Um, it's a singer, they're singing, kind of singing pitches, but also speaking at the same time. And there's different interpretations of that. The person who asked Schoenberg to write the music to Piero Lumiere uh, was actually an actress and not a singer. So, um, but. It's a really interesting thing. Pull it up on YouTube. There's all kinds of different interpretations, but it's really fun. And the way Jess presents her poems uh, reminded me the most of Sprechstimme. So, so I'm not quite doing Sprechstimme, but Sprechstimme is spoken, singing at the same time. And mine's closer to just spoken, but there's a bit, like I'll have pitch changes a bit with, to go with some of the moods, some of the meanings that I'm getting across. So I'm like edging toward it. Um, right, so the next slide has the score to Piero Lumiere, um, but the poetry is in a meter, it's the poems of Albert Giraud. Uh, there are um, four sets of seven poems, and um, the seventh movement in particular is just for flute and voice, and that's what um, Schoenberg's score looks like. So if you look at the, the flute parts on top, and then, uh, so definitely in a meter, six four, I think that's what it is. And then um, the bottom part, the rest of the poetry, has these little uh, signs on it, these little uh, things on the stem. And that's what he means by, the, here's the pitch, but you can kind of move between the pitches however you want. You don't actually have to do these pitches, but he did want the speaker to, to speak in that rhythm. And that's where we differ. Schoenberg said in his introduction, which is very funny, I you know, don't read the poems as a performer and try to, um, to give your interpretation of the poems into the music. It's already been done by the composer. <laughs> so um, he said it would detract from the music if you did that. So um, basically, he, as the composer said, you know, the, the composer is the one who should be giving the rhythms and so you shouldn't change that. And we work a little bit differently. The rhythms emerge with the poetry, and then when she writes music to go with it, sometimes we'll switch things, like she'll ask me, wait, 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 you should pause there for a little while. So that's when things change that aren't on the page that need to happen on the stage. Um, but definitely, I'm not gonna just hand over the control. So this is where we see the marriage part coming in. <laughs> she doesn't get to decide what the rhythm will be, but neither do I. So it's really in that synergy of those two coming together and something new emerges. Right. So the next slide should be the score. Yeah, here's Pain Jane. Pain Jane is one of the most personal poems for both of us. Um, and there's a lot, this is where I really felt like I was writing a little bit more melody or more music and not just responding to the text. But in this, in the line, you will want to die Jess actually wanted certain sounds. The same thing with the doctor, uh, Russell Marshall, a joke. Um, that, she wanted certain sounds. So again, I asked her to pause in certain places. She's gonna ask sometimes for certain sounds that um, she she had written want. something and I was like, oh, that's not sounding the way like I hear in my head how the doctor comes across. So there's a lot of interaction and give and take as we kind of bring these things together. So the line, you will want to die, is the closest Jess comes to Schrechstimme. I match her rhythm and her sound, so if you want to yeah. check it out. Let's start with the doctor. Okay, so. The doctor roasted a marshmallow. 
marshmallow. A joke, the doctor said. You will want to die. But don't, said her friend. And she, she does this the same way every time, which is great. It makes it easier to do the music. Um, but, um, so can we go to the score of what There's also a problem. So I didn't want that total control that Schoenberg creates in his music. And he opened the door to the 20th century idea of the composer has complete control over everything and you do exactly what the composer says. I come from a more um, historical performance point of view, Baroque. So there's a great um, treatise by Bartold Kuykens, who's a famous uh, Baroque flutist, called The Notation is Not the Music. And that's where you see an Urtex score piece of music and that's not all there is. You have to add, as a performer, you might have to add notes, you might have to add articulation, but you at least see it and add this idea of a phrase and everything to make it more personal. Um, and so there's a problem of notation in this. This is my score that I wrote, uh, and it's still quite not quite right. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, if, if you think Word or PowerPoint or any of those are difficult programs, um, the, the music notation programs are about 100 times worse. And Sibelius, which is the program I use, wants there to always be a rhythm and a background tempo. So all these rests in here mean a certain thing to performers, but it's not what I want. So I've made all of the gestures line up with the the poem, with the parts of the poem that I want, where I want it to happen, but the rest are somewhat meaningless. You're not going to sit there and count one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Okay, do. <laughs> That's not how this notation works. So I'm still still dealing with this. And a friend of ours, Dr. Jessica Scher, wrote her dissertation on a few of these poems and created a score. So she listened to a terrible recording that we made of these poems in our kitchen over and over again and put the voice in a meter like Schoenberg did. So then it becomes much easier to put the flute part with the voice. Unfortunately, I think this actually adds a little bit too much control and takes away some of the improvisatory stuff. So part of what's happening, and similar things happen with poetry, so when it's written down versus performed, is that it can seem very much static. This is exactly how this should be. So if anyone else were ever to perform it, it should be exactly in that rhythm, and it can become, it doesn't have the same kind of life to it. Um, but again, that difficulty coming up with working within the systems that already exist for how to notate music, trying to get it so that it could be shared, but without losing that sense of flow. So, The Shape of Jane, um, I had to look up amino acid side chain. I have to look up most of the things that are in the poems. Um, and it kind of had that shape. And there's a, a thing in music analysis called neo-Ramanian theory, where you make a graph. And across our fifths and going up and down our thirds, and you make little triangles. And it helps explain chord progressions that aren't quite um, what we're used to seeing in Bach or Beethoven, like these really chromatic sections in Wagner operas or Tchaikovsky symphonies. So it's a way to visually see how the music is traveling through keys. So I took that graph, and it's probably wrong, but oh, I put fifths this way and the thirds across. But uh, I, I made the shape of the amino you know, acid side chain, and that's how I chose the, the, the notes to use. And so remember, that's the poem where I'm actually exploring the shape of the molecule, so those three disulfide bridges, her hot structural motif, that's all, instead of being an apple or an hourglass, she's the shape of the molecule. So then the way she wrote the music is also trying to follow us with the, the amino acid side chain with one part of that molecule. So then actually building a music around that idea of what is the shape of this character. And that's, um, this is the best score I have, I think, <laughs> as far as how it looks and, and how um, it lines up with the, the music. Um, there's the note D over and over again, so if you remember the shape, all of the notes circled around the note D. So whenever there's a word like stability or bridges, I feel like it all balances on that note. Um, 
So that's why the word stability, the note is D, to sort of point out that idea. And that's part of the molecule. The way that it's shaped gives it a stability that allows scientists to then derive medication and use of humans that could be used in humans because it would help the stability. It's used to paralyze fish. That's what the sea cell snails use it for. But they can take just one component and use that stable molecule. This is the only piece that we did today that I didn't write the music to. This is um, uh, some of the poems that we've done, I'll take a hymn and kind of play around with it. Or for this one, I it's such a, a change from the first stanza to the second as far as a kind of hopefulness but scary, oh, I have to go through this um, terrible procedure. And then the second half is joy. So I thought of the Telemann uh, Fantasies for Food Alone, which is from the Baroque period. Um, and I picked one section that has a grave section mark, which is a very serious um, dance, uh, slow and in a minor key. And then it, I cut to the allegro section the movement that comes after it. Um, it's a very happy dance moving around. And I had to make it fit into the length of her um, uh, stanza. And that's another one that changes a little bit each time. So with each performance, it might be so she's picking from the first part, like she said, that's a bit more serious, and then the more joyful section. The actual notes and the actual measure she plays will differ depending on what speed we're going at each day, um, some of those other factors. And I played it on um, a Baroque flute word for verso, which is, this is a copy of, a, of an instrument from the 17th, 18th century. Um, and it's got one key, and it's the grandfather of the silver flute that we have today. Um, and it's super fun to play, so I decided to take a chance and play the telemon on this instead of the silver flute. Um, and I will continue to do that because it was fun. Yeah. Um, and I almost forgot about this slide. So like <laughs> I mentioned, some of these, so Jane in particular, there's a bit of autobiography in there, but unlike a confessional poet, and I think Many professional poets are fantastic. So Anne Sexton, Sylvia Plath, it's very much here is my story. Um, a lot of times there's a lot of power in that. But I want to look at how that story can connect to other people and be, le I'm less interested, does it seem to make sense of something that happened to me? And also it lets me make things up. Like I have a poem where I have this two year old daughter who's like, I didn't know you had a kid. I don't have a kid. I just wanted that first person intimacy without it having to all be autobiographical. But we just thought that it would be a little funny to include that's actually me after one of these um, procedures. And I drew a bow tie to put a band-aid on your throat afterward. If you're supposed to go home and rest, I would go teach a class or two and then go home and rest. So I thought I needed to look. And she couldn't really speak after, <laughs> so she would be whispering to the class. 13 Blackbirds looking at Jane. I asked Jess to write this poem, so I take total credit for it. <laughs> yes. uh, I played a, a recital for my 30th birthday, and I played a lot of blackbird pieces for the flute. The flute's always a bird. Um, there's a piece by Messiaen called Le Noir, and there's a piece by Sidney Lanier, uh, who, everything's named after Sidney Lanier down here. He was a, the great Georgia poet. He was also a flutist, and he played in the Peabody Orchestra in Baltimore. Um, and he wrote flute music, and he wrote poems to go with his flute music, so I feel like he's what I'm trying to do. But he's like our two animal, <laughs> the two of us together. Um, so for this 13 blackbirds, I took a 13th chord, G, B, D, F, A, C, E, so it's all thirds. There's a 13th between the G and the E, and took made all of the music out of those, those notes, except some of the funny things. Uh, there's American, American, the American Crow is The American the Crow, I use the Star and Strikes Forever piccolo solo. Uh, Lenore, which is spelled completely differently from Beethoven's Lenore, I took a flute solo from Beethoven's Lenore for that. Um, and then there's improvisatory sections of bird call in both the first movement and in the uh, four through 12, uh, based off of that chord. So you can really, I want the performer to make up rhythm or but do whatever they want, but use those notes. Um, There you go. 
Oh, they happens twice. Yeah. So this first part, after at the end of the first stanza, where they're actual bird calls, and these I got just looking up how different um, websites like Audubon, different government websites that are tracking migratory birds and various birds, how they would spell trying to explain what these bird calls are. So I took that from there. And so then those are the parts that go with the more improvisatory section. Right, and it happens again in Crow when he crow cries, all 27 crow cries. I bring it back a little bit. So there's some unity in all of those um, sections also, which is typical of a musical. Then some other things happen here where music and poetry merge. At the very, very end, the boy who cried, cried. There's that pause, and we call it a sushura. So whenever within a line, and it often happens here, there's a comma to indicate it. There might be a period, there might be a comma, but when there's this pause, and it's often used to then create some sort of, it'll intensify meaning or maybe reverse the meaning. So here in this case, the boy who cried, Cried. So I give that pause to then say, well, there's nothing else that you can do. So obviously that's the, going back to the fable, the boy who cried wolf. But in this case, he just cries. He just keeps crying. Um, and other places, the Tushira, let me find the other poem. So like in the cross-dressed and cuttlefish, if you can see, if you were human right here, if you were human, we would kick you out of school. So there I've actually just left white space in the line in order to create this additional meaning. So the syntax, the sentence just says, if you were human, we would kick you out of school. But by putting in that sashira, by breaking that, it makes you stop on we would kick you. So that brings in the violence that can happen to people who don't follow what society has set as the norm. So that sashira, that pause, so similarly, Sometimes in those pauses, she'll play something to heighten it, but often we just have this moment of silence that you may have heard in some of the poems. And that is so you can really hear exactly what the line is doing to try to enhance the meaning. So now that we've arrived at To the Cross-Dressing Cuttlefish, um, this one is scored for alto flute. That's the huge flute that I play. It's lower. Um, and since we're underwater in the cuttlefish, I thought it should, of course, be a lower sound. Um, this is a beautiful poem, one of uh, my favorites. It's actually when um, Jess first said that she wrote a poem about a cuttlefish, I thought maybe she had lost her mind <laughs> or watched one too many PBS documentaries. But it has so much meaning and so much um, uh, beauty to it that I wanted to make this a, a little bit more melodic, kind of like Jane Jane. So there's a lot more sound in it. And I use a pentatonic uh, scale, which is five notes typical in pieces by Debussy, who wrote La Mer, uh, which is the ocean. So there's water, all this water stuff from the French composers especially. That's what I kind of had in my ear. And um, this actually has a key signature, which I don't give to most um, uh, pieces, because there's a little bit of a key change in the middle uh, when she's describing the wires, big trip divers, going through coastal waters, all this motion that's happening. Um, I wanted to change key so it travels back and forth between things. And so that goes along with the idea of, again, trying to keep things very free so that things can be reinterpreted different ways. It can be a very alive um, performance, yet being able to indicate where certain things do need to happen. Like you still want that key change every time to show that shift from one mode, one mood of the poem to another. And then, um, because it's an ode, I was learning about odes Jess can teach me, and in the middle, she addresses the object of the ode, and so she addresses, oh, most intelligent of most intelligent of vertebrates, and this is another spot where Jess asks me to change the music. So there's all this stuff, because we've got kicks and belts, so it's very punctuated and loud, and suddenly I have to switch to a dolce, a sweet sound, because we're, we're calming down. So that was a, a shift in the music there, just like and then at the very end, she always says, teach us to see what she sees. Um, and so I've written each of those notes of the pentatonic scale with um, those, those words. And that's another one. 
where the line itself, there's white space in the line, and part of it is to make those pauses, so teach us and really let that sink in to see. So that lets you think for a second all those different meanings behind to see, so to really understand. Also just the idea of what can you see, what can you bring into your senses, well they have those W-shaped pupils. So even sight, we think we all know what that is. Well, it's different depending on your particular anatomy. Um, and then of course at the end of what she sees. So what is it about the cuttlefish that someone who's a little bit different, that's something that's celebrated and we see, you know, that's personifying. But she chooses that sperm. She wants her, that, to be what carries on with her children. Again, we're putting, I'm putting words in her mouth as if she were a human. Um, but there's definitely, that choice happens many, many times, again, statistically significantly. So bringing that into the human world, what is it that we're not seeing that tends to, many people will reject people who don't fit the particular norms, the societal norms. So trying to question that, but instead of doing it in a really angry way, by the end of the poem, just bringing it down to this reverence and this beauty. So we've got a few minutes left, about 10 minutes. Did any questions come up? I know you guys were kind of shy, kind of quiet before. Any questions about any of the pieces, any of the techniques that we did for any of them? So some of these poems you made your own? Yeah, so I wrote all the poems. Um, I picked some lines. So when I said like the Yates um, or the Lily Collins line, if you were the knife, the bread and the knife, so that just kind of alludes to another poem, but these are all my particular poems. Uh, I was wondering how much uh, the rhythm of your poetry changed as you collaborated, as you were writing music. Did it kind of stay the same, or did you did it change every time, or uh, were there certain spots? Yeah. You both collaborated. So primarily, I am a very sound-driven poet, so as I'm writing, the rhythms that I'm hearing will lead me to change things, you know, the next line. Um, and as I kind of accidentally memorize my poems because I go over them over and over and over again to hear what they sound like, and it can take a while when I then go back and revise to change it. Um, so much of that would drive then how she would write the music to go with it to fit those rhythms. But then there are definitely a good number of times, so maybe 25% of the time, there'll be a place where she'll say, well, either for a practical reason, I need you to pause here because she's switching instruments or she has to be, do some kind of extended technique. And so I would change the rhythm of the poem for that practical reason, or she would notice things that I hadn't even considered. Hey, if we pause here, it let her do something really interesting musically, but it actually ended up enhancing the poem. Maybe I put in a tissue I hadn't thought of that brought out more meaning. Um, so it's definitely a back and forth. Most of the time the rhythm of the poem drives it, but many times I'll change things based on what she's hearing as well. Other questions? So where did you get inspiration from the giant poems? So I, Again, there's a lot of autobiography in there, so I actually was electrocuted um, and developed a nervous system disorder that causes extreme chronic pain. It's on the pain scale above natural childbirth and above a digit amputation without anesthesia, except it never stops. And crazy things will happen, like my arm will just jump um, because the nervous system is just fried. But then I wanted to make it not just about me, so it became this character to see what could she do, and this, it, it often would feel like my own body kind of falling apart and pulling it back together to keep going. Um, so with Jane, I was able to just create this world where I could just make her eyeballs float away in this poem that we didn't do. And it's, it makes sense, because in Jane's world, that kind of thing could happen. So I could take the figurative, because I was in this kind of liminal space, you know, liminals in between, between, um, when you see this happen in Pain Jane at the end where she's the light light in the path between the breathing and the stops, that's that liminal space between life and death. And many people end up in it for whatever situation someone gets injured, you're waiting, sometimes for positive, you're waiting for news, did you get that job, did you get that promotion, or you're waiting to find out if someone's going to make it, um, or it might be again a physical situation, an illness, but that 
liminal space that in between. So I saw with Jane, her character just kind of emerged from that. She can be in between different kinds of worlds. She doesn't have to follow the rules of our world, and that actually lets me comment on some things that happen in our world more fully, if that makes sense. I really like how you characterize the animals in this movie. Pose, how you have Bird has this sort of hasty, short tempered attitude, and then the cuttlefish was more um, graceful and, and thoughtful and sort of emotional and things like that. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's really what she adds. I, in the poems, I try to get that, so that was already yeah. there a bit, but it comes so much more to light. Oh, yeah. Hearing it and hearing her play. Yeah, especially the, the flute sound with the, in this poem specifically, with the movement of, you can almost see the movement of the cuttlefish in the water. I mean, it's just the sound of the flute. Thank you. Yeah, we have, we have a lot of fun doing these. So. Uh, you talked about issues with the notation. It doesn't fit well into the finale of the Bailey. I'm wondering how many versions or how many different Systems you've tried. Uh, Basically, I've gone from this chicken scratch <laughs> to in the past two months <laughs> trying to put it into just some alias. Um, I think I tried Muse Score or one of those free ones online. It first happened because the movies do these together in various places, but she's a very busy musician. She would be out of town, and someone will there could be an opportunity where we could perform just another flutist, Jessica Sheeran being one of them, would sometimes perform with me, but they couldn't figure out what, you can't read my handwriting, it's not possible. And even if you could, you know, she knows what she means, because she's just making up a way to tell herself this thing she's doing that's not typically written down in this way. And then the first poems that we didn't do when I first started doing this, it was actually just a Microsoft Word document, um, and then I would write what to do over the word. And that is still true in th uh, 13 Blackbirds. The first one is notated. Um, but then the second, the rest of it is all, here's the poem, and there's instructions with each thing. So do this on each word, or I highlighted the word crow in 4 through 12, because there's notes on that and what to play. Um, it's up a third for a regular crow, when the crow sees the other crows, it's backwards. <laughs> so, um, and then what quote to do. But yeah, it's it's still not quite fitting. It'll be a, probably a lifelong struggle. Jessica, Cher, and I will, will probably get together at some point and see if we can come up with a middle way between that metered um, thing. Because the, uh, the idea for her was maybe we could, you know, definitely people have stepped in for me because Jess is such a consistent reader, but no one's tried to read for Jess, and that's a typical musical thing if we were to publish this as a piece of music, anyone should be able to perform it. But then I thought of all the electroacoustic people and all that who have a tape that is the same over and over again and they play music on top of that. So I thought perhaps we should record Jess <laughs> doing this and then you could do the music with it however you want it. So that might be what winds up happening if you get a little, I'll put it on the cassette tape. <laughs> But it's been an interesting <laughs> challenge to see what happens with trying to merge what we're doing with what already exists. So I know that it's 2 o'clock. We're happy to keep answering questions, but I want to hold people who need to get somewhere else. So thank you very much for coming. Thank it's been you. wonderful chatting with you guys and for listening. We have fun doing this, so I'm glad that you came to just hang out with us. And we will have a great rest of your semester. I see many students here. So thank you very much. Thank you.